so it's my privilege to introduce to you uh, right now uh, Dr. Bill Rice III. Let me say a couple of things first, and uh, then we'll look at the fourth chapter of Colossians. So when you find it, look up this way, and I'll know you're ready. Good. I think everybody knows Mary, but I don't want to take it for granted. So let me let you meet my wife, pal. Would you stand up so they can see you? We have three kids. Will, you know, he's an evangelist. He's preaching tonight over in Lauderdale. And he and Cena have three kids. And then Wendy lives in northern Virginia. Her husband is a lawyer, and they have three kids. And then Wren lives on the ranch where her husband works in systems. It's called and finance. He works in that, helps us at the ranch. And Wren writes music. Let me just mention quickly about the book table. The books back there do not belong to us. They belong to the Bill Rice Ranch. I want to mention two. First Light, uh, Volume 2. Last year we had First Light, Will's devotional book, Volume 1. This is Volume 2. 365 devotions plus extras for Christmas and extras for New Year. And this book is $15. And then I just love this book, Says Who is a study in Genesis written by Lauren Rice, and it is delightfully written. You'll just love reading it because of the way it's written. You'll enjoy it. My favorite chapter is 8. Um, chapter 8 is about Hagar, and um, you are not cast out, I think. Um, yes, you are not cast out lessons from Hagar. It's just great. A great chapter and there are questions at the end that you can fill out if you want $15 for this book $15 for this book but if you get them both people just tonight if you get them both you can get them for $26 in fact there are four different titles five different titles six seven including these two on the table that are $15 any Two $15 books you can get for $26. A savings of over $500. <laughs> if you buy enough books. So you'll have to take care of that, but that's back there, okay? I got to tell you this story. I shouldn't take the time to do it, but I got to tell you. On the way to church tonight,
Be with my friends as they listen. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now, we have read the names of four men here in Colossians chapter 4. This is written, of course, by inspiration by the Apostle Paul. And we don't know any of their names. We don't know their names. Look down in verse 7. Notice uh, the name of the guy there. All my state shall... Tychicus. Look at it. I would think it's Tychius. Wouldn't you? But it's Tychicus. Now I have I have read this same name in a number of the epistles, and when I read it, I read it Tychius. Because I don't know the guy's name. Now, if uh, if your husband's name is Bob, and I said to you, how's George doing? <laughs> You wouldn't hear another thing I said, would you? Until you straightened me out on the name. Well, how do you think Tychicus would feel if you called him Tychius? <clears throat> then Onesimus is the second person. Now, some of you may know Onesimus. He's in the book of Philemon. He's the runaway slave. Do any of you remember him? He ran away. He went to Rome. He was led to Christ by the Apostle Paul. And the book is a wonderful illustration of salvation by grace through faith. And that's Onesimus. The third guy is my favorite in this group. His name is Aristarchus. You'll find his name uh, in verse 10. Aristarchus. Uh, I have a friend when I was in Bible college and he was preaching out on the weekends. And he mispronounced Aristarchus' name. He called him, are you ready for this? And Chipras. <laughs> and he said, and, and Chipras. And the amazing thing is, the people there in the church did bad enough. <laughs> they just all sat there like, yes, thank God for that wonderful saint, and Chipras. <laughs> well, his name's not and Chipras, it's Aristarchus. And then the last one, is called Marcus. I had to look this up. This is John Mark who wrote the gospel. Okay, so we don't know their names. That's number one. Number two, we don't know what they did. If I said to you, this guy in verse 7, Tychicus, what did he do? Now, we don't know all that he did, but there is information about him in verse 7. Look back at verse 7 again. 
All my states shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant. Now the word minister means servant. You know that, don't you? A minister is a person that ministers to people, so it means servant. So he is called a minister and my fellow servant. So evidently being called a servant and a servant, this guy was a real servant. Now, we don't know what he did, but he did do something, and it's worthy of our noting. Uh, Onesimus, I already mentioned just briefly. Let me tell you the interesting thing about Onesimus. Onesimus was a slave who ran away, who could have been put to death. Paul sent him back to his master, Philemon, and said, If he wronged thee or oweth thee ought, put that on my account. I, Paul, will repay. And it's a picture of what God did for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a wonderful, wonderful illustration of the gospel. But he could have been put to death. And Onesimus, who was a slave, it is said of him, he's one of you. I just love that. He's a slave. He was guilty, arguably, of death. But when he came to Christ, he was just one in the church. He was one of you. It doesn't make any difference what your background, who you are, what you know, what you don't know, where you went to school, where you didn't go to school. If you know the Lord Jesus, you're one of us, aren't you? Mm -hmm. And if we know the Lord Jesus, we're one of you. Then the third guy, Aristarchus. I first came across Aristarchus a few years ago when I was reading and Acts 27. Now, Acts 27 is the chapter that explains Paul's shipwreck. You remember that? He's on board ship, and the ship is wrecked, and God promised Paul that nobody would die on board ship, that everybody would make it to safety, and they did, and they got to this island, and then Paul was bitten by a snake. Remember the story? And so it is referred to often by many of us as Paul's shipwreck. But in reading Acts 27, I think it's verse 2, it says, and when it was determined that we should sail to Admiralian, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, joined us. So Aristarchus went to Rome with Paul. Now, we don't know Aristarchus. We don't know much about Aristarchus. But he was a fellow prisoner, the Bible says, of the Apostle Paul. Now, if I said to you, you remember Paul's shipwreck, what would you say? Amen. Yes, okay. If I said, remember the shipwreck of Aristarchus? No. We would all go, Era who? I didn't know he was on board that ship. Let me ask you a question. If you were Aristarchus' brother, or his mother, or his son, would you refer to the shipwreck as Paul's shipwreck? Or the shipwreck of my brother, son, or father, Aristarchus? Now, we don't think of it as Aristarchus shipwreck. Well, you say, yeah, but the Apostle Paul had preached the gospel and was going to Rome as a prisoner for having preached the gospel. Well, so was Aristarchus. Mm -hmm. Paul calls him his fellow prisoner. Why do you think he was going to prison? You think he just wanted to take a vacation in Rome? <laughs> no. He was on uh, en route to Rome just like Paul. His life was in danger just like Paul's because he was a fellow prisoner. Now, we all know about the Apostle Paul in prison, but there have been before Paul and after Paul, are you listening? Literally, <clears throat> literally thousands of believers who have gone to jail for their faith. Mm -hmm. They're going now for their faith. Did you know that? Yes. Christians are being murdered worldwide for their faith. Aristarchus is one of these people, but we don't have to think of him. I, mean, I wouldn't, because I don't know Aristarchus. And then the last guy is Marcus. Now, I mentioned what did Marcus do, because I wouldn't have known had I not looked it up in the Bible. In other words, I had to go to helps and look up Marcus and see if this was, in fact, the Mark who wrote Mark, and he is. But I wouldn't just have known that. 
It's not something that I would just commonly know. And let me ask you a question. In our minds, when you come to the work of a person, would David be more well known by us than Marcus? You know where Marcus lived, you know what he looked like, you know how many kids he had, you know uh, what churches he preached in. We don't know much about Mark, do we? Would we know as much about Mark as we do about the Apostle Paul? Well, obviously not. We well, say, yeah, but but uh, Paul wrote much of the New Testament. I don't care. The only reason he wrote much of the New Testament is because God told him to. Let me ask you a question. Has a pastor written any of the New Testament? Yes or no? Okay, why not? Because God told him not to. Do not add to or take away from the book. Is that not correct? Okay. So if I said the reason our pastor didn't write the New Testament is because God told him not to, and therefore he was obedient. Now, the reason Paul did write part of the New Testament is because God told him to, and he was obedient. Okay, so Paul, obedient. Pastor obedient. You following this? Well, yeah, but Paul was obedient -er. <laughs> No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. The point is he did what God told him to do. I can do that. You can do that. We can do what God tells us to do. So these men, we don't know their names, and we don't know what they did. If you were in school, and you had to write a paper on... Antichicus, it would be approximately one paragraph. Would it not? We don't know a lot about him. We don't know his name. We don't know what he did. If you were asked to make a speech about Aristarchus, it would be brief indeed. Everybody would love you. Your speech would be about 30 seconds. Because we don't know his name. We don't know what he did. We don't remember often the name of Onesimus. Now, if you knew it, you could say, oh, yeah, that's right. He was in the book of Philemon. See, so we, we could know him that way. But we don't know much about Onesimus. And we don't know that he was greatly loved and a member of the church. He's one of you. He's there. Um, John Mark, we know probably less about Mark than Matthew, certainly than John or Luke, the physician, um, are the apostle who wrote many of the epistles. So we don't know these people. We don't know their names. We don't know what they did. But the Lord Jesus knows all about all of them. And here's a wonderful truth. Um, at the Bema Seat, the Bema Seat is the judgment seat of Christ. You know that? All right. The judgment seat of Christ is for rewards. In 1 Corinthians, the Bible deals with the fact that the judgment seat is for rewards. It is not for punishment. Somebody says, well, yes, but if you don't get a reward, might you not be embarrassed or sad? Well, I suspect that would be true. Well, then wouldn't that be like punishment? Now look at me so you can get this. You ready? If I go to the judgment seat of Christ and I'm not given a reward, by the way, what do you do with the rewards once you receive them? The crown. Just throw them at his feet. All right? Everybody with me? Okay. So if I go to the judgment seat of Christ and I'm not given a reward, is that like punishment? All right, are you looking? No. It's nothing like punishment. Punishment is punishment. The lack of rewards is the lack of rewards. Now, it would be wonderful if you and I had rewards in serving God. That would be wonderful, but... Uh, if, if you don't serve God as you should, you're not going to be beaten up for it. Look, Christ died for our sins. Past, present, or future, which would it be? Oh. It's all of them. In fact, all of your sins were future when Christ died, were they not? Mm -hmm. All right. I'm forgiven. <clears throat> My sins are taken care of. Judgment in the sense of punishment will not be part of my estate, period. And to suggest 
that the judgment seat of Christ, we're all going to be embarrassed, is to uh, negate the facts. For example, you ever heard of this? At the judgment, there are going to be screens up there. And everything you did in life that was wrong and bad, every time you chewed gum in church, it'll be shown on the screen. And you're going to be so embarrassed. No, you're not. Because it's not what it's about. Uh, if there's sin in my life, can I be forgiven of it as a Christian? Yes. yes. If there's sin in my life and I'm not forgiven of it, that is my fellowship is not restored with the Savior over it. It could be, but if it isn't, am I going to be slammed at the judgment? No. Listen to this passage. Galatians 6. Be not see, God is not bought. What sort of man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth in the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And he that soweth in the flesh shall of the flesh uh Excuse me, he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap life everlasting. He that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit, uh, he'll have everlasting uh, uh, truth to himself. And then it says, and let us not be weary in what time? Can you help me with this? And let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season you shall reap if you pay not. Now look, Galatians 6, 7 through 9, which I butchered. Galatians 6, 7 through 9 is not talking primarily about sinning and then facing God with it. Now, it does mention that. If you sow the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. That's true. It doesn't last. It corrupts. If you sow the Spirit, you reap life everlasting. In other words, what you do for God lasts through eternity. But it's talking about reaping what you sow that is good. Look. Somebody says, you cannot sin and get by with it. That's true, isn't it? Yeah. But you can't do right and get by with it either. Mm. And a lot of times we think you can. We think, well, I did what was right. I gave or I went to church or I prayed, but nothing came of it. That's why the Bible says, show me yourself and deceive God's involved. What you show, you reap. See, so don't be weary as all of us tend to be in well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we faint not. Are you following all this? All right. Why then is it that we look on the negative side of it? And somebody says, you know, one day you're going to face God. Well, you are, aren't you? Okay, do you have to face God with dread and fear? Well, you say there's unconfessed sin in my life. Well, take care of it. Well, I haven't served God um, in every way that I wish I, I would have or I could have. Well, I know, do the best you can and serve the Lord. Let me ask you a question. At the Bema seat, when the name Aristarchus is called out, do you think we will be frightened at what we hear or blessed by it? Blessed by When the name Tychicus is called out, do you think we're going to go, oh, my goodness? Because this could be rough, or do you think we're going to be sitting there with smiles on our faces, being blessed? How about how about Onesimus? Isn't he going to be a blessing to me? How about um, how about every child of God who is named or unnamed in Scripture, but whose life is is exalted? For example, in Hebrews chapter eleven. The Bible speaks of the heroes of faith. Remember the famous chapter? And in the middle of the chapter, after having said, uh, women have their dead raised to life again, and wonderful things have happened, the passage says, and this is always struck in my heart, it says, and others. Okay, there are people who live for the Lord and love God who will see people healed, who will see provision, who will see protection from God. But the Bible also says that there are people of faith, it calls in in Hebrews chapter 11, and others. Folks about in sheepskins and goatskins, they were destitute, afflicted, tormented, 
of whom the world, the Bible says, was not worthy. Who were these people? We don't know. In Hebrews chapter 11, it, uh, one, one verse says they were sawn, not a sin this, sawn asunder. In other words, there were, there were God's people that were literally cut in half. Mm -hmm. They were in prison. They walked about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. And you don't even know who they were. I don't either. We don't know. Have, have, have you ever said, boy, things are really rough right now? Have you ever said that? Mm -hmm. Haven't we all said that lately? I was griping with a pastor friend. Now, don't get your mind on politics, all right? But I was griping with a pastor friend of mine about politics and about our leaders. And he said to me, well, Bill, we don't have it nearly as badly as the Apostle Paul did. Well, is that true or not? Okay, now I would say uh, things are as bad politically as they've ever been in my lifetime since I can remember knowing about politics, which starts with Eisenhower back just after the flood. You remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I would say, you know, things are pretty rough. And I, I think it'd be fair to say that, but it is nothing like having a... a an egotistical uh, leader of the world who would dip Christians in oil and put them on stakes to light up the pathways for Romans. By the way, it's nothing like the Holocaust, is it? It's nothing like what people lived through in Germany. It's nothing like what people live through today in Russia or in Iran. Isn't that true? So, all I'm saying is this, there are people of God that none of us know anything about, and you're going to absolutely want to shout when you hear what they've done for the Savior. Amen. Well, it would be nice if you were one of those people, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, then, okay, set out to be one. Uh, could you be a servant like Tychicus? Could you be one of the church like Onesimus? Could you be a fellow prisoner, if necessary, like Aristarchus? Could you obey God and what he tells you to do, like John Mark? Couldn't we all do that? Uh, the Apostle Paul, we'll, we'll, we'll stop with this. The Apostle Paul said in, in Timothy, the time of my departure is at hand. And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. And he said, I have kept the faith. I fought a good fight. Uh, he stayed the course. Well, let me ask you a question. Instead of saying, could I write part of the Bible? Could you just say, I, I'll keep the faith? Couldn't we do that? Mm -hmm. Couldn't you, um, couldn't you um, live your life as best you know how, just for the Lord, just, just serving? Couldn't we all do that? Mm -hmm. Somebody says, well, yeah, but I'm just, I'm just a little nobody here in this church in uh, South Florida. And, well, you're not a nobody to the Lord. Mm -hmm. God gave his son for you. He died for you. You can serve him, and you are. And all things being equal, at the Bema Seat, you ought to have a couple crowns to throw at Jesus' feet. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Mm -hmm. And if there's sin in your life, you don't have to carry it out of this room tonight. Just say, dear God. Um, the, the Bible says, if we agree with God, if we say we do no sin, we deceive ourselves. But if we come to a place where we call sin what God calls it and agree with God about it, he will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So isn't that true? In other words, couldn't I walk out of this building tonight, cleansed of wrongdoing, asking God to help me be a servant that that he could use and could serve him faithfully like Tychicus and like Onesimus and like Aristarchus and like John Mark.
They're not going to headline the Super Bowl. You know that, don't you? But they're the kind of men that make the cause of Christ what it is today. And you can be in that group, and I can be in that group. I don't know that I will ever, you know, be the uh, the preacher that the Apostle Paul was. But what's so? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not supposed to be like the Apostle Paul, am I? In fact, it was the Apostle who, by inspiration, said that when we compare ourselves with ourselves, we are not wise. Last summer, um, there's a family that stopped off at the ranch. The Ranch began in 1953. This will be our, our 70th summer. And uh, family stopped off. And the lady was just excited to be there. She was probably my age. I'm 79. She was probably my age. And she said, oh, yes. She said, we used to come to the ranch back in the day. She said, my dad always wanted us to hear the big preacher. Okay, now I know what she meant, and I, I appreciate that. There are preachers that we all thank God for, are there not? Amen. That maybe are well known. All right, that's fine. But if you're not a big preacher, but you're faithful, doesn't that count for something? <laughs> if you're not a big preacher, but you're a deacon, doesn't that count for something? If you're not a deacon, but you're just a member of the church, you know, in my church, my son, Will, is a deacon. In my church, I'm just no. I'm just I'm just a member of the church. Well, isn't that all right? Isn't that okay? All right. So somebody says, "Well, I'm not as smart as, or I'm not as wise as, or I'm not as rich as." Hey, set all that aside. God knows you, and that's not something to strike fear in your heart. It's something for which you should be thankful. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for loving us. And thank you for raising up men like Antiochus and Aristarchus and Onesimus and John Mark. We're thankful for them. And we pray that you use us, right, to use them. Not in doing the same things, we can't do that, but in being faithful and keeping at it and simply serving you. And we pray she'll help us to do that. And we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Pastor. <coughs> Amen. We're going to uh, stand together. And uh, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. And as we do, I want you to think about what you just heard. And think about how the Lord can how the Lord has and how the Lord will use you. And uh, as, as Dr. Bill was speaking, I was thinking that uh, we, uh, another preacher I knew very well, Dr. Parker, said we can't all be great preachers, but we can all preach a great gospel. Mm -hmm. and, and there's so much truth in that. So how, how can the Lord use you? Well, ask him, ask him, and then be willing to do what he says. If God's spoken to your heart and you need to respond tonight, I'm here. Or Dr. Bill's here. There are other folks here that can help you pray with you. And uh, you come as the Lord leads you. So we sing hymn number 388, Have Thine Own Way. Oh. 
when Bill Rice was working on the Graham Ranch, he had no idea how God was using both the tragedies in his life and the calling on his life to combine into a ministry burden called Bill Rice Ranch. In 1930, Bill Rice was 18. He was orphaned. His parents were gone. In a couple of years, he would marry, and he and Catherine Widener Rice would have a beautiful baby daughter named Betty. Betty would become deaf, and they had no idea that God would use that tragedy and combine it with their calling to reach people with the Lord Jesus, the, the gospel of Christ, to combine into a ministry reaching deaf people for the Lord Jesus. In 1953, when they had their first week of deaf camp on what is now the Bill Rice Ranch, they had no idea how it would grow. 
And quite frankly, sometimes I think I have no idea how the ranch has been able to sustain its ministry through these many years, except that there is a God and God works to people like me and people like you.